All right, so the, using event streams to orchestrate a serverless application. Um, this is me. My parents named me Jonathan, but I usually go by John. And to confuse things further, my email is actually JD. I've been in a lot of project teams where there's lots of Johns, and I end up being called JD. So I actually got that on my business card right now. But John at Tiki Springs also works. Um, so what I'm going to be doing tonight is uh, sharing sort of a side project that I've been working on. It's just kind of like a hack together. Uh, an application to see if I could get an entirely serverless backend based on event streams to, to run an application doing, you know, reading, writing, updating the basic elements of an application. So I'm going to show you that. Where are we? Uh, this has nothing to do with Minecraft. I just needed a picture with a map and a UR here. Uh, where we are now, this is about our fifth or sixth session, and most of them have been done by uh, Daniel here, so we're giving him a bit of a break. Um, and I'm going to take the wheel here uh, and walk through this sample application. And then the future weeks, we're, or future months, I guess it is, we're hoping that some other people are going to share their projects they're working on both from work and their side projects and just kind of share ideas. And, and, and uh, we're here to learn together. And that's kind of the, the movement of it. Before I actually get into the rest of the slides, I just want to quickly show you. Um, let's just see. Is that coming up there? Yeah. So I'm actually just going to log into the sample application once, just so you get a, a little bit of a perspective and you, you understand what it is I'm talking about. I should have had this set up before. Do, 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 do. So my sample application is, um, I, I built a little time tracking application. So it's kind of like the quintessential to-do list, but I happen to be using time tracking. This is a little debugging panel. So what we're going to be seeing here is this This is built in uh, Viewtify JS. I just got the label up there, which is the view stack. It's a lot like React, but it's um, it's just a different different um, framework. And Viewtify is a material look and feel um, application framework uh, that's ma made to conform to the Google material spec. And it's pretty neat because it gives you all these little, you know, rollout menu bars. And I'm using these... Uh, what do they call them? These little um, chips for my date filters here. And I can filter by um, like text, for example, and search. So these are just sample records um, of data. And then what we're going to see in a moment is that when we go to write updates, that it uses sort of a, a different type of application model back in that you, you may or may not have used before. And I'm sort of experimenting with. So there's not much more to see there right now. I just wanted to show you that so that we have a little bit of a perspective over here. And we've already been through, uh, in earlier talks, the basics of what is serverless means. And there's, there's whole presentations on this. And everyone's got their own few bullets that they say, um, you know, this is the type of thing you're going to see. There's no servers. It scales with usage. You don't pay for idle. Oh, I can use this remote too. But what does serverless mean to developers and architects? And to me, the biggest thing it means is that we're abstracting away the idea of a server node. So you don't need to think about what's a VM, what's a container, or an instance. Uh, everything is basically just an API call. If you want to compute something, you can make an API call and just say, run this code. Or if you're looking for storage, you can make an API call and get a storage bucket available, or a queue, or a stream, or any sorts of, diff of the different uh, cloud pieces. These are kind of categories in here. You could be serverless uh, compute, storage, streams, queues. All these types of things. And the, all the cloud providers, the major ones, offer different um, you know, ser services that, that fall into these categories. So with AWS, you, know, you see all these weird icons that no one quite understands. These are all the different pieces of cloud development. Not all of these are serverless. Some of them are. Um, but they're all available through API calls to, to at your disposal as an architect and a developer to when you're building, you can leverage the utility that they provide. And you know, these are the ones here from Google, or so just a, a, f a handful of them. Microsoft's got their own. But what are all these little blobs and, and icons mean? Well, to me, I kind of think of them as Tinker Toy, because they're these things you can assemble into systems yourself. I know Daniel was using the Lego analogy the other week. I like to think of Tinker Toy, because these little balls are actually kind of like those little icons, and you, you stick the sticks together to, to make things out of them. So that's the way I think of uh, what, what what AWS, to me, I'm using AWS just because that's, that's the one I know the best. But there are all the cloud providers are similar. I think it was just a big bag of Tinker Toy that I can use to assemble and try out these different experiments about what a back end or, or middle tier might look like. So 
common use cases of, I'll just go through this quickly because we've heard about all this, but a functions as a service piece, it could just be something simple like an endpoint where an API gateway gets a request, does something and sends back an answer. It could be a triggered by an event, like you, you upload a file and then uh, a serverless function as a serverless piece runs and sends an email to somebody. Or it could be used in stream processing where there's a whole bunch of click stream data coming from your website and you're, you're somehow manipulating it a bit before you put it into the data lake or into an S3 bucket or whatever. Um, so those are, the, those are common use cases, but those are all just singleton uses. Each of these different types of things here, a function as a service is just getting used for one particular thing. It's not a whole system. Yeah? Oh, a cold start problem? Yeah, yeah. A yeah. uh, cold start problem is basically just that uh, a function as a service is really something running in a container. And so behind the scenes, the cloud provider needs to sort of really quickly provision that and get it ready for you. So the first time you do that, it takes a little bit of time to get going, and it hangs around for 15, 20 minutes. If there's idle, it might disappear again. But if, you, if you're using it consistently, it's going to not be a cold start the next time. You'll get... It, 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 Yeah, there, there's, there's time limits too. A particular function invocation in AWS, I think it used to be uh, 15 minutes, now it's 30 minutes or something like that. But typically what you're doing is you're, you're in and out of the door in, in sometimes just a couple hundred milliseconds, depending on what the use case would be. Like if it's an API gateway endpoint handler, API gateway itself times out after 30 seconds and you wouldn't want an API to be longer than that. So your function is gonna be much shorter. If you're doing stream processing, it's not really kind of like the, the traditional map reduce big job. It's kind of a, a different type of stream processing where you you have a whole bunch of these running in parallel, just taking out different pieces of data from the stream and working on them. I'm not an expert on, on this type of stream processing myself. <laughs> I'm, yeah, maybe next time someone else can do it, yeah. But I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that these are all cases where you can use a function as a service, but each one is just a really particular job it's doing. It's not really part of an entire, what I would call a system. So what I want to do is start exploring what it looks to be in a system. So this looks a little bit scary at first, but this is kind of a schematic of, of the, the system that I've, I've built here and I'm going to show you tonight. But just to, by the end, this will make sense. But let's start by just looking at this little piece in the gray box here. This is everything you've seen so far when I gave that quick little introduction and I logged in. This is all the read side of the application. So when you query, oh, sorry, when I, you saw me hitting search and changing the date filter and typing in a couple words, all that's doing is sending an API request to a Lambda and reading Elasticsearch. So it's all just Elasticsearch, which is a great tool because it lets you, it, it slices and dices, inverts all your data into columnar form so that you can you know, search by keywords, multilingual tokenizers, all sorts of fancy stuff. But that's, that's all the, the, the read side of it. So everything else around the outside is the system how it does the, the updates and the, the other aspects of the data management that it needs to do. And th this is a bit of a complex design, but I purposely chose this because I wanted to experiment with it. What I'm using is an asynchronous update engine. So the commands come in the top, but they go out the bottom. So when someone says, I want to update this record, there's a, an API gateway that receives that. It puts the request into the system, and we'll go through these kind of details in a minute here. The system does its thing and it, it processes the update. It might have been successful, it might have been a failure, whatever it may be. And at the end of the day, the response comes back as a push message out to the client. So it's asynchronous. It's not that you get an answer on the same uh, invocation of the call that's coming in. So it, it's a pretty complex <laughs> way of doing it, but that was kind of what I set out to do, was just to see if I could get that working. Um, you might wonder why I have an IoT piece in here. Well, the AWS has a whole IoT stack. And what it does is it uses the MQTT uh, protocol. Uh, it's basically just a, like a pub sub for devices. And if you think about IoT, the sensors are, it's built in such a way that it's resilient to interruptions and it can resume communications very easily. Uh, because the, an IoT sensor could be you know, something embedded in a cow or, or buried in the ground measuring salinity or some sort of crazy application like that. So it, it needs to be able to handle the fact that it's not in constant communication with the cloud. So as it turns out, that's actually a cool protocol to use for a web app because 
These days, web apps are running on your phone, they're in your pocket, you're going into an elevator, into a subway, and you get disrupted communication. And by using this, uh, this uh, stack here, I was able to use the MQTT pub sub as a way of sending messages back to the, the mobile app. Um, you don't need to do all this today. <laughs> Since I started hacking on this, uh, AWS has released a whole bunch of new stuff. They have the um, AppSync suite of, of uh, APIs and what that does. That's kind of more like a Firebase for distributed communications. And it would probably be a better way to set this up. And I will probably migrate this to that just because I would want to learn the new framework too. But this was kind of a more piecemeal way of putting it together. So we'll come back to this. Um, but let's just talk about the event streams and message bus because, sorry, that's the piece up here. We'll go into more detail about it. But that's what I set out to do, was to see if I could build an application using uh, an event-based model. So why would I want to do that? Well, one thing to think about is the complexities of having all the different functions that make up a system work together. So you think, let's pretend I just had sort of five functions. And from a systemic point of view, they sometimes need to invoke each other and do different things. And so it, it introduces sort of by nature this, this tight coupling, which you don't necessarily want. The cohesion between the different parts of your system, this function needs to know how to call this one. What's the function signature? What's the payload? How do I do it? And you end up with these dependencies, and it's not really as, as, as loosely coupled as you would want to see. And then obviously if everyone has to call everyone else, it exasperates the problem even more. And when you have more functions or more pieces of your system, it gets even more out of control and you end up with a spaghetti web. So why the event bus? It's just a way of simplifying this model because rather than have every function need to know about everything else in the system from an from a integration standpoint, it's much easier with a single communication bus because then each function just needs to know how to talk to it. So it can read messages, do something, and put an answer back on the bus. And we'll see that in a moment when I go through the building blocks of what I've done. But that's the theory behind it. And then it's also extensible because at any point in time, I can easily just add a new piece and it can start listening to messages and start providing facts to the other elements of the system without having to sort of get in there and break apart the big ball of mud as, as, as far as what's calling what. So those are the, the good characteristics of it. There's lots of downsides too, and, and I'm sure you'll have lots of interesting questions around those, but th th that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, what I set out to do. So it helps simplify the integration, create an extensible architecture, because it's easy to plug new things in. And then finally, it promotes event-driven design. So the event-driven design is where I'm going to go next. But I'm um, just thinking it might be a good time to break if the pizza's just arriving. And then we'll sort of pick it up from the event-driven design. I think that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to pick up from where I was, talk a little bit about event-driven design. And I, there's a bunch of slides here I'm going to try to go through quickly, because we don't really want to read s slides all day. This is just basically saying event-driven dri design, you're not thinking so much about the things, but more about the verb. So, you know, classic domain objects when you're doing a system architecture, things like customer, order, order header, order detail. Instead of thinking about that, you start thinking about the actions, what has happened. A new customer was created. Would be an event customer added, or an event like order updated. Um, and what is an event? An event is basically a, a fact of information that, uh, that happens over time. And knowledge is the accumulation of facts. And once a particular fact has happened, it's immutable. It can never be changed. But the knowledge it represents can be changed by a superseding event. So an, a new event can come along and sort of supersede the effect that a previous one had. But it's still not a change. It's not changing the history. It's just adding to it. So knowledge is the accumulation of the facts. And there's all sorts of common use cases for events, notifications, uh, state transfer is the most common. We'll see. Uh, state transfer a little bit in this demo, but it's also if you've used any uh, AWS state functions as a way of gluing together all your lambdas, a similar, similar sort of model. Here I'm just comparing and contrasting. Again, I want to do this kind of quickly, but in a command-based model of system design, you're thinking about imperative things. It's about intent. You are doing something like creating an order. You're calling the order function. You're tar targeting a particular thing with a set of parameters. It's very control-focused. In event-driven design, it's, it's, it's more intentless and anonymous. You're just pu a particular worker node has a job to do, and then it's just publishing facts. And then there's another worker node that is listening to facts, doing something, and publishing a new fact. So it's very decoupled, very anonymous, and intentless. 
and therefore it operates asynchronously. Command in imperative type programming command oriented architecture can be asynchronous. It's usually synchronous, but like Node.js, for example, is very asynchronous. But from beginning to end, it's it's synchronous. It's just the individual steps might happen in parallel, and you get into your callbacks and promises and all that kind of stuff. But in event-driven design, everything's almost always asynchronous. So this is the, the, the converse, first of all. Synchronous call stack is, let's say that we're not doing something with the funny architecture I showed you with the big loop around that we're going to come back to in a minute. Let's say we're doing it the conventional way, where the API gateway gets a request to update a database record. And on that same request, it's going to do the work and send back the answer. It would be this type of conventional uh, synchronous call stack, where there, there, there's some program logic being done, and then there's a call out to another service that's going to do something. You need to wait for the reply, which returns control to the calling context. Then it goes on and does the next step, which might be the actual database update. And then the reply from that comes back, and then maybe you augment that data with something else. And finally, you know, the call stack, like the concentric circles start to fall back upon themselves, and at the end of the day, you have the answer, which then gets returned to the calling client. That's sort of, that's the conventional synchronous way. The message bus asynchronous design pattern that I'm trying to illustrate here is different. It's more of a linear thing. So we'll see this concept of a message bus. And the way that it works instead of the, the, the call stack we just saw is that the first step in the process is the request gateway. It gets the payload of the update request. What it does is it puts that on the message bus and then it simply returns 200, okay, or whatever, that's an HTTP status code, doesn't matter, but it just returns an answer to the, the calling cl client right away because it's done as far as it's concerned. It's received the message and it's not going to give an answer. So from the perspective of the, the, the payload that's coming in, this is like the, it's like the Roach Motel. You check in, but you don't check out. You come in and then the, simply the only answer is, okay, thank you, we're done, 200. So what happens? How does it get processed? Well, there's various steps along the way. Some sort of a process is listening for this event. It does something and then publishes a new event. And in this case, it's update request prepared. And then there's another handler which listens for that event, does something and publishes a new event. And that's the updates confirmed. And then there's another handler that kicks in. And it sees, ah, oh, the, the update is now confirmed. So I'm going to do my job, which is to send the response out the push gateway back to the client who initially uh, requested the update to begin with. And then that also publishes another event. So if you look from left to right, you see there's this chronology of events that sort of, uh, that correspond to the steps of processing that have occurred. And each one of these steps along the way is invoked asynchronously. So back to the diagram we were looking at earlier, um, this is what's going on up here. I've got a message bus, which is in Amazon, uh, it's using Amazon's Kinesis, which is kind of like Apache, Apache Kafka, just a, a message streaming service. And these are the, the individual handlers are in Lambda. And if you'll see, I, I actually have these yellow things. You're not supposed to understand what that icon is, but believe it or not, that's a queue. So I'm sticking a queue in front of each of those Lambdas. And why am I doing that? Well, basically what it does is it acts like a, like a bathtub sink and it acts as a buffer for the, because you don't know how much volume of information is going to be coming in or how many requests a particular handler, handler has to deal with. So think of, think of it as a bathtub sink. And then the, the, the process worker is the drain at the bottom. It's handling a particular request from the queue, and then it's handling the next one, and then it's handling the next one. If the rate at which the water is coming in is faster than it's draining, you're going you're gonna to get backfill, and, and the sink gets higher with water. But then if the, if the arrival of events slows down a bit, the, the, the handler can keep up with that rate, and you'll get the water level slowly going down. And as an architect, what you have is you, you got some knobs you can play with, right? So in my case here, it's this, the sync drain is analogous to me controlling, controlling the concurrency of how many lambdas can work a given queue. So I can dial that up and down if I see that a particular, you know, on my observational panel in, in the whole um, observability side of the system, if I see that a, a queue depth is going above a certain, um, level or, or, or benchmark that I'm not happy with, I can dial up the, the, the parallelism of how many concurrent workers. And like, likewise, I can, I can dial it down again. So that's why I have the queues sitting in front of each of these lambdas. It was just part of what I decided to do when I was feeding this all together. And this kind of reminded me of um, 
okay, this is a bit of a complicated slide. I'll try to do this quickly. There was a cool presentation at Functions 18 called When Serverless Gets in the Way of Scalability. I don't know if anyone was there. I know Jay was there because he was presenting with Frank. Um, but the folks from DTYL gave this presentation and they were talking about serverless gets in the way of scalability. Basically, how do you control the bottlenecks that are in your system? And in their case, they had a synchronous flow from beginning to end of the system. And there, there's just a couple takeaways here. One is that if you solve the problem of a particular bottleneck, a lot of the time, all it does is move the bottleneck somewhere else. So in their case, like there's a bottleneck at the API and you solve that, you get a bigger, you get a bigger throughput that now allows more messages in but then the bottleneck just becomes somewhere else because there's some other part of the system that can't handle that sort of pressure. So what do they want to do about it is they actually wanted to control the, the, the throughput rate at their gateway because if something's going to fail, they want to fail fast and they give that error back to the calling context so that they can decide what to do. Maybe they retry again a little bit later. What you don't want to do is fail slow, like accept the request, have something downstream break, and then it's just an unpleasant experience for the calling context because it took them that long to find out that it's not going to work anyways. But the problem is you can't set throughput rates in, in the cloud provider services. There's no knob to set what do I want the throughput rate of this Lambda to be. All you can set is concurrency. So what the engineers at DTL were, were looking at was this thing called Little's Law, which is basically the relationship between concurrency and request rate. We want to be able to set the throughput rate, but the knob we have is the concurrency. So how do you do that? Well, it's basically just that the, um, as you can see here, it's that the, the number of items in the system is equal to the arrival rate times the average time that it's in the system. And th that's basically what they're using. So, and they were actually took it one step further and they built this little feedback loop so that they, on the observation plane, whatever it may be, maybe it was CloudWatch or some sort of a third party metrics tool set, they would be looking at the performance of their system and they would dynamically change the concurrency up and down of the lambdas at the beginning of their uh, system to in response to how long certain events were taken because you don't know what the, the time each one is going to take. Anyways, I d the reason I included this is because I couldn't help but think when I'm looking at this that I wonder if this would be a lot easier if they were using an asynchronous flow as opposed to a synchronous flow because then you'd have all these individual knobs you can turn and you can adjust the queue depths and the concurrency at all those different parts. So maybe it would be a better model. However, there's a lot of cases where you just can't use an asynchronous delivery pattern where the command and response are coming on different channels because you need real-time, really fast information. Like if you think about like an air traffic control system or some sort of like medical situation, you, you don't want to just be waiting for a reply. You know, certain APIs need to have replies right away. So it's not going to be right for probably most situations, but it's, it, it, it's, it's an interesting design pattern because it does have lots of advantages. Uh, so this is, again, one more thing. I've already talked about the extensibility, how because it's a message bus, we can plug new pieces in and start listening to existing events that are already on the bus, and they can start supplying new, new events. Another thing to do uh, th that I thought of with the extensibility is one of the things you can put up front, maybe one of the first workers that handles the inbound event handling or event listening would be like a triage worker. So if you think of wh like what a triage nurse is in an emergency center, it's like you, you assess a, a sick person coming in it because if they've got a thorn in their finger, it's very different than having a metal pipe coming out of your stomach and they're going to put you in a different queue in the ER system based on the severity of your, your problem. You can introduce a worker node up front in your event bus driven system that assesses the, the, the request that's coming in and puts it in different queues. So maybe you have an elitist queue, like you've got a, a gold star member of your application who's on a paid plan and they get a queue with more parallelism than the, the freemium people who are in the, the slow queue. You know, it's something you could do. Or an even better case would be uh, a situation where you have work coming through that's not any human on the other end. So maybe it's a batch job, like somebody's uploaded a, a 30 gig file to be converted well, the latency on that doesn't really matter, so I could put it in a queue, which is basically doing the same work, but that queue only has one worker, and it might even sleep for a few hundred milliseconds between jobs, just because we don't really want that chewing up the capacity of the whole system. So it's just another idea I had about how the extensibility helps out, and that's what that picture is. So let's talk about what are these individual queue workers that we're looking at on the message bus. Um, so I'm calling this the, mon the mantra of a queue worker. This is what it does, it listens for an event, it does one thing really well, and then it publishes a fact. And that's the whole concept here, is that we're decoupling all the logic in our system so that each piece does one thing really well. Kind of reminds me of the, the, the Steam Whistle Brewery in Toronto. You know, that's their marketing slogan. We do one thing really well, and 
It's been successful for them. It's a great beer. So this is what a key worker is going to do. Uh, oh, and I just put this in here just as a reminder. If you're, if you're sort of designing a queue worker and you start thinking about these other problems, maybe it's not something that needs to be coded inside that queue worker. Maybe it's someone else's problem. And where possible, we want to we want to try and enforce that. If you're following this design pattern, say, hey, that's not my problem. I'm just going to publish a fact and let, let another worker, an ex extensible piece, take care of it. Um, so. But if you follow this pattern, you build them this way, these pieces are independently scalable, deployable, versionable. I kind of like that concept. I don't know whether it works well from a DevOps standpoint in cloud. I think one of the future talks we're hoping to have too is someone who can share some uh, how you do DevOps for serverless information with us. And I think some people may have done that, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And then you, yeah, sorry. It was on the recording, I suppose. Yeah, so there oh, we go. Oh, so don't curse. If you want okay. a question at the end, we can wait till the end. Yeah, I'll wait, till the, I'll wait till the end. Okay. I'll wait till the end and then. Okay, so we want to, uh, uh, the other thing to do with these, because they're, they're decoupled and they're independently doing one thing really well, we want to try and avoid synchronous dependencies between them. So if you're, if you're coding a queue worker and you have the, the need to, to call out and get some information from somewhere else, which would be blocking I.O. and would slow that down from doing its one thing well, maybe it doesn't belong there. Maybe it should be somewhere else. And when I was thinking about that, it reminded me of, of, of the whole same line of thinking you go through when you're taking a monolithic system and decoupling it into microservices. It's kind of the same analogy. So I saw this slide from, from Jonas Bonet. He talked at QCon 2018, and he was talking about microservices design pattern, again, breaking up a monolithic system. And he's talking about things to avoid. And, and you know, this, these are my microservices. Ideally, they have separate state. You don't want to be sharing state, and you don't want to be making synchronous calls between them. And he had this funny term that, that made me laugh when he's talking about if, if, you, if you break that rule, you end up with these things called microliths. <laughs> because it's, you think you've solved the problem. You've created all these little, li little microservices, but it's still like a mini monolith. So he calls them microliths because you're, when you have the synchronous dependencies between them, or even worse, if they're sharing each other's state, you're missing all the benefits of what you're supposed to be doing with. And I just like that term because it just sounds so bad like you messed up. Like I can just picture my buddy over my shoulder looking at my code and saying, dude, you created a microlith or something. It just, it just sounds horrible. So I thought that was kind of cool. And it's it just because it's the same concept that we want to avoid between these things. It's, a, it's just a, a sign that you might have done something not optimal. Uh, and that's what this is. Let's try not to have dependencies between them. It might be an upstream or downstream worker that better does that other task that you're trying to call out to do. So where are we now? Let's walk through. Oh, here's the events. So, so what are the events? The events can also be versioned. They're the key to the information flow. So the, the metadata that comes in the original update request gets passed along between all these events as they get published. And therefore, you can embed whatever logic you want in there. So it becomes the key to tracing and debugging. And we can see a little bit of that when I do the demo. I haven't done too much there. Uh, okay, so we'll walk through these quickly. I, I've gotten rid of this first one because it wasn't doing anything in my particular demo that I'm going to show you. So we had the request come in, put the update requested event on the message bus. The first thing that has to handle is this update handler. So let's look at what it does. We know what a, uh, a key worker is supposed to do. It's supposed to do one thing really well. It listens for an event called update requested, and then it updates the DynamoDB and publishes a fact. So DynamoDB is my central store. Elasticsearch is the one I'm using on the other end of the, the, the read pattern. They're eventually consistent separated data stores. So on the DynamoDB, it is a NoSQL database, but it doesn't mean you don't have data integrity. So I'm doing a really simple, the most simple form of data integrity, which is just a timestamp on every record. So it's a very si simple algorithm. When you read a record, you get a timestamp. It could be part of the record itself, or it could be a separate metadata envelope. Wh if you make a change and you submit that change, you give back that timestamp. And then this update worker is responsible for saying, is the timestamp that you're giving me the same as the incumbent value in the record? Because if it's not, I'm not going to allow this update. It's a dirty read you have, and uh, therefore it's not a legal update. So that's the simple form of data integrity, and that's what I'm doing in this, uh, this handler here. Uh, and then it does the DynamoDB IO, and it publishes either an update confirmed, update failed message. Um, 
Dynamo, DynamoDB has this cool feature. If, if it fails, when you get the error message, it actually con contains a, uh, a flag that tells you whether or not an error is retriable, which is kind of cool because then you could make a decision about what your fact might be. You might publish an update failed permanently versus an update failed temporarily, and that's going to determine what queue it goes into or what other worker might be interested in listening for that event. So for example, if you're failing because you've exceeded your throttling limit on your account, that's just temporary. You can try again you know, half, half a second from now, two seconds from now. But if it's failing because my data integrity uh, failed, I had a dirty read that I was trying to update, that's never going to work again. So there's no point in putting it in a queue to retry. So it's just kind of a neat feature. Obviously, you could implement that logic yourself, but it's nice that the engine itself gives you a flag that tells you whether or not it's retriable. So we just went through that one. The next one, we're getting towards the end here finally. The next queue worker is the confirmation broker. So it listens for this event that the update was confirmed and it decides to send the answer back out to the client. So it was a lot of work just to do an update. Uh, so this same thing here, queue worker does one thing really well. It listens to this update confirmed event. It sends the messages on the MQTT channels and then it, it, it publishes a fact that it's delivered. I've got two different channels. The reason I chose this is because there's when you, when, when you log into the application, there's one um, pub sub topic per session. That's my topic. And then that's what gets used to send the replies back to me. But then there's a second channel, which is a company-wide channel. So picture this time tracking application that you saw briefly. I might have 35 different people in my company. And when they're all logged in, when certain things happen in the back end, it's going to send messages out on the company channel too to keep things in sync. And we'll see that. It's kind of like the way that AppSync or, or Firebase is going to work. And the nice, th the nice thing about two channels is it, it doesn't matter if there's 35 people in my company or, or 150 people in my company. I still only need two channels. So it's not a linear scale with the size of the company or logarithmic. It's just, it's just a nice constant number. I need to publish two messages. And on my, my session-based channel, I can publish a nice fat message with all the data I need coming out from my update response. But on the company channel, I just, I just publish key information. I want to keep those messages lightweight because it's, they're going out to everybody and people don't want to be wasting their communication bandwidth. But it's a nice event to, to know that something else is updated because they might want to refresh or take action upon what other people are doing in the system. And you'll see that in a minute. Okay, so finally, uh, demo time. And then I've got a few more slides after this. We're getting there. Uh, let's see. I think this is the one I was using before. Oops. Of course, that's going to happen in the demo. <laughs> Just kind of log out and then to make sure that I don't have a broken. All right, so this over here uh, are the two channels I was just talking about. This is obviously just all debug stuff. It's not pretty, but from a developer standpoint, I've got this little area here where I'm going to receive messages on my session pub sub. And at the bottom, this is the company-wide pub sub. Uh, this is the reading we saw earlier, searching. This was all done through uh, Elasticsearch. So now we're going to do an update. I'm going to try to update this record here. Um, do, 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 do. Sorry, I don't don't really know how to use a Mac here to do that quickly. I have changed this. Okay, so the first update might be slow because of cold start problems we were talking about earlier. Um, you can see now that I've saved it, it's gone into this pending state. So what's happening is this message was sent to the API gateway there. It's finally come back saved. It went on to the, it went on to the message bus as an update requested and all those different handlers have had their little job. They've done it, they've seen the event, they've done the update published the response, which I got back. This is just a big JSON mess. But I think you saw that the, the pending finally changed to saved after we received back the, the answer on the out of phase message. Um, and, and so that's that. That seemed to work pretty well. Um, maybe now if I do another change, it'll be quicker because there's no more cold starts. So let's see how fast, there we go. So that's not bad, eh? That's a that's pretty fast response for something going right through that pipeline from the gateway to all those different handlers touching it and the answer coming back to me. And what I'm, what I'm hoping to get to with this is in my little experiment I'm doing by building it this way is that that latency we see there, yeah, it's slower than if I just did it synchronous to begin with where you could probably get the thing down to, you know, a couple of hundred milliseconds. 
But I'm thinking that this is going to scale way better because I can independently control all those parallel workers and the size of the message bus is, is sort of limited by the cloud. So I'm thinking that hopefully when if you have thousands of simultaneous, user, simultaneous users on a system like this, you'd still be getting those same times, what we just saw there, which was just under a second. That's, that's the hope anyways. But maybe we can do a future test uh, or a future presentation on, on testing this with a, um, a tool that just throws tons of data at it and see how's it how it performs. I haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay, so that I just want to quickly do, uh, how do I get out of this here? Sorry, I'm not, uh, yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay, now I have, no, 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 oh, this is my other one over here. I had two of them going. No. Sorry about this. I'm just not used to this. What I'm going to do is get these two windows. Oh, it's this one here. No. <laughs> Sorry. How do I? Okay. I just want to get these windows side by side. I'm just a bit of a not used to these. Oh, geez. All right, it's super thin, but I'll use it this way anyways. So I'll log in here as user one. I'm just going to demonstrate sort of the, the company thing. So this is a Gmail, I think. I had two separate users. Uh, yeah, that logged in. Cool. And this one was this person. Let's hope that logs in. Um, so first thing what I'll do is I'll try to test this uh, synchronization of data across multiple people. So I'm going to change something here. Um, and that is now a pending change. It's saved. And you know what? I'm probably not looking at the same data. I'm getting confused by these tiny windows here. Let me start again here. Yeah, I've, I have totally different record sets here. There we go, that's the same record. So what I'll do is I will change this again and save it. So this one's pending. It's gonna come back quickly with a save. Not so quickly. Just on the wrong page or something? Sorry, I'm a little lost here. Here, let me go away. Start that one at the top, start that one at the top. Yeah, that other one, that, that th I think this other window has lost its uh, MQQG channel. Anyways, that's unfortunate. I do have a movie, maybe we'll come back if we have more time. I don't want to waste your time with it now. But basically what happened was that the other one just kind of refreshed to say, hey, because it got the message that someone else had changed the record and it realized, hey, that's a record ID that's in my viewport. So it goes and queries and gets the updated information and shows it, um, which is what you'd see in like a Firebase application or um, what's the other one we use? Pivotal Tracker, we had a Pivotal person here. You know, Pivotal Tracker where you got all the Kanban boards and someone else makes a change. You kind of see it glow for a second because it's someone else's updated. And that's what I was trying to demonstrate there. And Unless I can get that, oh, it's, it's the same thing for the error. I'll come back uh, if anyone's interested and show that afterwards because the, the, I have the other condition handled when I hit the save button exactly the same time in the two windows. One of them succeeds and the other one comes back with the error. But I think what's happened is that this one window has lost its um, MQQ, MQTT channel. That, that's um, a good reason why uh, I'd like to try and retrofit this and use the, um, the uh, app sync. Is that what it's called, the app sync? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically the, uh, replaces that other stuff that I'm doing, but it gives you the same effect. So hopefully we will get there. All right, let's see if I can find my presentation. Where did that window go? No, oh, it's back here. Perfect. Okay, so a couple more things and then we're done. Um, I just wanted to mention this. This is a slide from a Chris Munn's presentation this year. Um, it just kind of demystify some of these different things that sound so similar, but they're slightly different in AWS. So for example, there's PubSub, there's queues, and then there's streams. And they all have different use cases and they're all 
have advantages and disadvantages for different business purposes. And so if you're a little confused about that, and there's, there's, there's tons, he d it, it, to be honest, in this presentation, he doesn't even answer the question. He just introduces a whole bunch of questions <laughs> that then get you thinking about what you need to do in different circumstances. But it's a good thing to check out if you, if you have those same questions as I did. What I used in this little demo app was a Kinesis for my message bus. And then I had all of my Lambda handlers with also a queue in front of it. So I was using both queues and the streams. Um, this is a, a slide I stole again from uh, Jonas Bone at QCon. This is about CQRS. And I, uh, I was demonstrating this uh, a certain amount in the application tonight. What this is is about separation of concerns from your your write side and your read side, which is exactly what we saw. So commands come in here, they go into a system, which is eventually consistent with the other system, which is the read side. And the way that I implemented that was that my read side is all from Elasticsearch, and my write side is all updating the Dynamo, and there's a stream in between that, that keeps them eventually inconsistent, um, the eventually consistent data. Um, but the, the nice thing about this is it, you can scale them independently and it's great for distributed systems because it's just when you try to have things that are distributed, consistent, it's like cap theorem, right? If you try to have everything, it, it doesn't really work too well in a, in a timely manner. So you're much better off not trying to be consistent and just d building your application logic around that fact. Uh, another concept quickly, because uh, it has to do with this, is just event sourcing. The concept of event sourcing is is kind of turning the, the database-centric view of the world on its head. You've probably heard about this. Um, so traditionally, the database is at the center of every back end, every schema. And even in my picture tonight, I had the Dynamo database right at the center of the whole application. Um, the concept of the, the event sourcing is that maybe the database isn't the source of truth. Maybe the event stream itself is the source of truth. Because if you think about it, the database is just a snapshot at a particular point in time of all the events that have occurred. Um, and, if, and if, you, um, if you think about that, then you could have all sorts of different databases from different perspectives of time, and they're just manifestations of what the event stream looked like at that point in time. So if you think about it, this is the way an RDBMS already works in internally. Like if you're an Oracle person, you'll know what the redo log is, or I think in MySQL it's called the write-ahead log. It's the same concept. There's just a log of all the change vectors, and the change vectors stacked on top of each other is the current state of the database. Um, and it, it's a nice uh, model for microservices too, because then you only want you only need to track the state that's in your bounded context. If you think about the bounded context of domain-driven design, you the event stream is common to everybody. Everybody can look at all the event sourcing that's happened, but they, they only need to keep state on the ones that they're interested in. So it's a nice model for that. And these are the other benefit it gives you. Uh, you can replay the log when never needed, and that's a cool. You can do that with Amazon uh, Kinesis. When you, when you introduce a new worker, you can say, is it just listening to events going forward? Or is it listening to events as of a certain date in the past? Or do you want it to start from the inception of whatever that the massive window is, which I think you're limited to 14 days, but then you can have snapshots of accumulated events uh, that go beyond that. So it's great for these the following reasons. You can, you can audit, trace. Uh, it's great for failure because you can recover to a given point in time by taking the most recent snapshot and then just adding all the events on since that time for replication, for reading. And then the big one that, well, it's not the big one, but it's kind of interesting is historic debugging. So this is the concept of time travel debugging. And we, uh, a lot of us who do front end development have already seen that over the last couple of years, it became very popular with React Redux and how you can, you can look at all the, the different events. So time travel debugging, I think I have a, a slide, yeah, you can't talk about time travel without Doc Brown. So the concept of time travel debugging is, like, let's, let's say you, ha you get the support case that so-and-so had an error at 9.30 this morning. Well, the first thing developers traditionally try to do is recreate the problem, and you spend half your time just trying to recreate the problem in the dev environment or the test environment. The concept of the time travel debug debugging on the back end is that you don't need to recreate the problem because you can put yourself in the exact situation that occurred when the problem happened. So if, if you're trying to recreate, if you're trying to debug something that happened at 9.30 this morning, you would spawn a new cl cloud environment that would take last night's snapshot, replay the entire event sourcing log up to 9.30, and you'd be right there with your toolkit looking at the events go by, and there, oh, there comes the request, and oh, there's the problem. And then maybe you can uh, make a change and see what the, the, the new outcome would be. And it's a pretty wild concept. There's no systems that, com that completely do this in the back end. As you say, it's, it's a common front end thing these days. But it's coming in the back end. Because what it would then allow you to do 
would be you can actually have like multiple realities and you can fork the past if you think about it. So let's say that you find a bug as you were looking at it at 9.30 in the morning. You could do a code patch and then once you have the, the repaired code, you could replay all the events over time that happened since 9.30 this morning and you'd have the alternate reality compared to what's happening now. And then if you think about it, you take the current database snapshot and that altered reality and the diff between those two right now is the change vector that's required to get you back on track given the problem that occurred. It's kind of sort of wild and woolly thinking, but it's, it's not too dissimilar from what we've already seen on the front end. So it's, it's kind of an exciting direction that, that data management on the back end might be going. And it might be all because people start thinking of event sourcing and event logs and immutable facts as the source of truth as opposed to the conventional, the database is the source of truth in the organization. So that's kind of something I'm excited about. So that's the end of it. So now go build something. Um, take advantage of the, the free tiers. All the major cloud providers have free tiers. Um, and I just added these notes in because this is really what I want to do next is check out AppSync and Amplify. I haven't done those things yet, but I think both of the Amplify is a, is a toolkit that came out that plugs into the front end, whether you're using a, a React or, or Vue environment. And it, it basically sets you up with all the API endpoints to do your Cognito auth authorization, your, your, uh, your AppSync data framework. Uh, so it, it's a toolkit provided by AWS for this purpose. So I'm going to check these things out. Um, and finally, there's this AWS serverless application repo, which is basically like a repository of all these different serverless projects that other people have made and then checked in. And you can go check those out and either alter them or look at how they're made and give you ideas. Um, so it's, it's a cool way to learn and to maybe give back and share some, some concepts yourself. I haven't even had a time to go through that yet, but there's a lot of neat stuff. Um, not, not a neat stuff there from what I've seen in other people's presentations who've touched on it briefly. Is it in GitHub? I, I don't know what, yeah. what it's backed by. It's probably their own. Uh, AWS. Yeah. The repos, yeah, they have an example repo yeah. Is it in GitHub? Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Because there's also these AWS code commit, which is a Git repository. I didn't know which one they use, but they're probably using GitHub, GitHub proper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is me. Um, I'm a, a I do consulting and contract work in the Toronto area. So if any of you have um, you know, projects where you're embarking on a, a cloud project or a serverless project and you might need a, a drop-in team member to help out with things, I'm available to do those types of things. If you're starting your first uh, cloud project on a greenfield and you've done your architecture and you're looking for another set of eyes to review an architecture and comment, critique it like a peer, peer review, I can do that kind of stuff. So feel free to contact me. And now, I, I guess it's time to throw darts at me. <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs>